This is the Ramana Maharshi, 40 Verses on Reality Satsang, a time to listen, reflect, and to inquire into the self. Know yourself and be always free and at peace. Welcome. I'm Richard Clark, hosting the Satsang. I'm a seeker like you, sharing what we love. I've been blessed with years of deep teaching and practice that I bring to the satsang. This week's reading from 40 Verses on Reality is verse 30 about the reality. If one inquires, who am I? within the mind, the individual eye falls down abashed as soon as one reaches the heart and immediately reality manifests itself spontaneously as I, I. Although it reveals itself as I, it's not the ego, but the perfect being the absolute self. You don't need to do anything to make the self more real. The self is always entirely real. The self is just hidden like the sun behind clouds. Clear away the clouds and the sun appears. It has always been there. The self is obscured by illusion, by an error in our own assumptions about who we are and what exists and what is not. Dissolve the illusion and the self shines. Key to this illusion is the I thought. The I thought is like a ghost with no form of its own. It seems to have the form of anything onto which it has been projected. The metaphor of the inchworm illustrates this. The inchworm moves by reaching out and grabbing a new support and then releasing the previous one. Its existence depends on these things that it holds on to. Like the inchworm is the ego with no real existence of its own. It grabs onto a form since it has no form of its own. And you take this form to be your reality. You say, this is me. This body is me. You take it to be real since it is created from your own reality. When you see that it's not real, that it has never been real, then it falls away. And what is real stands unobscured. Investigation into the I thought seems to make it disappear, but it was never there to begin with. It was just an imagination, an untested assumption. When the I thought is extinguished, you stand as you are, the self, one without a second. Now, some notes for your own practice. Look within. Inquire. Can you find the form of your ego, your sense of identity? You can find attachments of ego, like the body is me, and I am a woman, and such. Can you find 
the I or me without this attachment to it? What do you see when you look into the formless consciousness that lights up this I thought? Or when you inquire, who knows this ego? Now to the uh, videos for this week. Excuse me. Well, first is uh, Adi Shakti with uh, verse 30 Aruna, the reality. Jana Shiva, Aruna, Jana. Namaste and welcome to the 30th episode of Hula Du Narpadu. I think this is the longest series I've done, at least as far as number of episodes. I try to keep them short so that they're easy to watch and understand. But today, uh, this verse is going to complete the thought that began in the last two verses. So if you haven't already seen those, go back and take a look at them. I'll put the links up here before you hear this verse. Therefore, when the mind reaches the heart by inwardly scrutinizing who am I in the above manner, and when the ego or mind, which rises in the form I am the body, dies, the one existence consciousness appears spontaneously as I, I although it seemingly appears anew, it is not the arising I or ego. It is the whole reality, Purna Vastu, the reality which is self. So this, as in many of these verses, is talking about the ultimate stage of self-realization, realization of self. And when we say self, we're not talking about the ego. The ego is something which arises and therefore it also passes away. Death is the ultimate passing away of the ego. But actually the ego arises and passes away many times a second. And if you go back and look at some of our videos in the past about Paticca Samupada, and the, uh, also the root sequence, Mula Parayaya, then you'll understand that the creation and destruction of the ego is simply a thought. That thought is based on the idea, I am the body. So if we attend to that thought, if we devote our attention and meditate on that thought, and follow it to its source, then we will reach the real self, pure consciousness, awareness, a subjective self, which is aware of everything, and which cannot be distinguished from any other self, because there's only one, <laughs> the self. Now, when the being comes to be reflected in a body and mind, it appears to be an individual. But this is simply this objectless awareness being reflected in a finite body. Actually, awareness has no boundaries. There's only one. Huh? Just like there's a theory kicking around among physicists now that there is only actually one electron <laughs> and it bounces around space and time and and makes believe that it's everywhere <laughs> and in everything 
It's not too far away, you know, from the truth. The truth is there is one being, the self, Brahman, the absolute. And when we come into this world, it gets reflected in a body and mind and appears to be the ego, but it's not. That's an illusion. So just like when one uh, mistakenly sees a rope to be a snake, when the illusion passes away and he sees, oh, actually it's a rope, that vision of the snake was never real. He was looking at the rope all the time. There never was a snake. It only seemed to be. In other words, it was an illusion. So in the same way, this individual self or ego, this mind and body arise, exist for some time, and then pass away. And how we respond to this determines whether we remain in conditioned existence, temporary existence, uh, suffering, or we get out of it and we attain moksha. So how do we respond when the ego passes away or when the mind or the body pass away? If we struggle to attain another one, we wind up right back in the same fix. We wind up right back in temporary condition existence, suffering like anything. It's miserable because our real nature is eternal, unconditioned, objectless, absolute awareness. And when we go away from that, we suffer. Just like if you uh, have to pretend to be somebody else, you know, a fugitive, for example, has to pretend to be someone he's not. It's very stressful. It can't be maintained for very long. Ultimately, they wind up giving up. Huh? Because why? It's just too difficult to live a totally fabricated existence. And in the same way, sooner or later, we get tired of this suffering. We've been going through many, many lives, many, many embodiments, pretending to be something we're really not. We're pretending to be this body. And we're exhausting ourselves with tremendous efforts to maintain this illusion. But actually, the self is there all along, just like the rope. Uh -huh. And when the mistaken vision of the snake passes away, the rope is there waiting for us. So in the same way, when this mistaken idea that I am the body, I am the mind, I am an individual, an ego, uh, by the name of so-and-so, and so on, when that passes away, we see what we really are. And our real nature has been waiting all this time underneath. So that's why this uh, conditioned existence is called upadi. Upadi means a limiting adjunct. It means a layer of conditioning, a layer of illusion that is overlaid on the real self, on the real truth. And because of that, oftentimes the spiritual master or teacher or God has to be very severe. He has to be hard. He has to say, you rascal, huh? You're pretending to be this limited, weak, stupid <laughs> person. But actually, you're the self, unlimited, strong, uh, with infinite power and unlimited knowledge and intelligence. <laughs> so what are you doing? 
you idiot. <laughs> I used to like uh, the old Mr. Natural comics, you know. He's got this one disciple named Flaky Funt. And Flaky Funt is always playing this game that Mr. Natural, actually, you know everything. And uh, you can tell me the secret of the universe. Huh? And he's always bugging Mr. Natural. And Mr. Natural is always kicking him away. You stupid, you idiot. Why do you want to know that? Uh -huh. And of course, the implied meaning is, don't you want to know who you really are? That's the greatest secret. So, but this universe is actually not a very nice place. Yes, it has its beauty at times. And this uh, serves to help to seduce us into thinking that it's worthwhile to be here. And it's not bad, you know, if you remember who you really are. Because it means that you open the door to the unconditioned life, the real self, the true awareness of, of who we really are. So if we're trying to represent this teaching, then we have to be very sober and very uh, acutely aware of the actual situation. And that means sometimes we have to be, uh, or actually most of the time, we have to be uh, not so entertaining. Huh? It's hard. It's tough. I know. I've been through it all, and I can remember a lot of it. How you first come in contact with this teaching, and it seems so alien. It seems so hard. What? You're telling me that who I think I am is an illusion? That I don't really exist as an individual? This is all bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why this teaching is not so popular. That's why, you know, we only have like 60 or 70 or maybe 100 views on these videos. That's why people aren't recommending them to their friends. <laughs> Because it's tough. It goes against the whole illusory struggle to be somebody in this world. And people are looking for advice and encouragement so that they can be somebody and satisfy their desires. But even if they do, huh, it means a tremendous struggle. Lots of hard work. And then, even if you're successful and you get the object of your desire, it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> There's going to be strings attached. You can bet on it. It's not going to be like your fantasy. And worst of all, it's temporary. It's going to go away. So I'm not going to tell you any of that stuff. Huh? It's nonsense. And anybody who does is a rascal who's just exploiting you. I'm going to be tougher. I'm not going to flatter you. I'm not going to tell you you're, you're beautiful and it's all about love and all this stuff. Because even if it is, the only way you're going to reach that is by some tough self-discipline. Sadhana. Sadhana means giving up these temporary pleasures, giving up the struggle to be somebody, just being content with whatever comes of its own accord, not struggling to make things better, but being content with how they really are, and going inside and finding the real enjoyment the real pleasure, the real bliss of self-realization. That's what's really going to make you happy. Not maintaining in this material world, because you can't. 
It's a lost cause. Everything in this world passes away. So why struggle? Why hold on to it? Why resist the inevitable? Simply a waste of time and energy. So maybe we're not going to be so popular, but we're always going to tell you the truth. And we're always going to speak with integrity. And we're always going to mean what we say and say what we mean and walk the walk as well as talk the talk. That's what you can expect here. And yes, the love is there. Yes, the beauty is there. But we don't just talk about it. We give you the tools to experience it for yourself. Om Tat Sat. Om Hari Om. And now, uh, Nomi will talk about egoless being. Existence is naturally egoless. And what is truly your existence is always so. The nature of which never changes. It is absolute. By the term ego is meant the assumption, an entirely false assumption of individuality, some particularization of existence or separation from this absolute existence. Sri Bhagavan said that the egoless state is the real state, the only real state that there is. Individuality, or the state of ego, of egotism, is an illusion and not real at all. Freedom from such illusion is known as liberation or abidance in the self as the self. The individual is not, but you exist. And the nature of your existence, yourself, is entirely that existence, the self, or Brahman. And it is never otherwise. To imagine otherwise is merely ignorance, which too is not a part from this absolute existence though there is no ignorance inherent in this absolute existence. For how could that which is of the nature of infinite consciousness or supreme knowledge contain ignorance? Or again, how could it be ignorant of itself? If one inquires, who is ignorant? Ignorance ceases. If one inquires, for whom is this illusion? 
the illusion ceases. The interior knowledge of the self. Being's own knowledge of itself. Transcendent of sensation and thought is true knowledge, truly spiritual knowledge. Words and thoughts used to express this knowledge should not be regarded as the knowledge itself. The knowledge itself is of a non-objective character. It is not an it. Rather, in self-knowledge, in which you know yourself, you yourself are the knowledge. From the position or perspective of an individualized I, embodied and otherwise misidentified, how this can be so is most mysterious. Yet in your eyeless true nature, your existence as it is, which is absolute and one without a second, what is being indicated is self-evident. If there is the assumption of being an individual, where is the proof of it? That you exist is the fact. That you are a supposed individual, well, it is just a supposition. The body is not proof of individuality. After all, whose body is it? That is, the body supposedly belongs to an individual, meaning the individual is distinct from the body. What is the individual? What is your own sense of I minus the misidentification with the body? Similarly, what is the nature of existence without misidentification with the senses? the herd of thoughts that seem to roam about. It is not proof of individuality or the ego. The thoughts seem to belong to someone. One says, my thoughts. 
the eye of that mind must be different than the thoughts. What remains of the sense of I if misidentification with any thought ceases? The further inward you proceed in this inquiry, the less there is to mark off the supposed individual, the more the sense of individuality vanishes or may be said to merge with Brahman. The closer the look at the jiva, the more he turns out to be Shiva and not a Jiva at all. What in ignorance is mistaken to be a Jiva or individual being is in truth only Brahman and not anything other. Illusion, delusion, ignorance of any kind, Bondage, suffering, the samsara, birth, death, etc. All these are for the assumed individual and never for the reality of the self. Abandon that false assumption of being an individualized existence and what you truly are, your real being, remains as it naturally is, as it always is. And in this is found complete peace and happiness, freedom from illusion, freedom from bondage, etc. Whatever appears as a problem or an obstacle or a bondage is for someone. Without that someone, what problem could there be? All right. And now we will take a few minutes to meditate, to inquire. Breathe in and breathe out long, slow breaths. Feel the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. And notice that you exist. You exist and you know that you exist. Now investigate within yourself, who am I? Am I a body? Am I the senses? Am I the light energy pulsing through the body?
am I a thought? Am I the mind? Am I an ego? Who knows all of these? Who am I? All right, let's close with a short chant. Oh. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om, peace, peace, peace. Now, thank you for letting me share this teaching with you. This series on Ramana's 40 verses on reality will continue in the following weeks. If this satsang was of interest to you, I have more, a free book site, a YouTube site, a podcast, and my blog. The URLs will be on screen next. Namaste.